Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Well, welcome. So excited um, for church today. Um, it's been, a, like Beth said, it's been a kind of a wild week, but it hasn't been like horrible, but it's been like weird, you know, you know that kind of week. But it's been all right. So we're excited, though, for uh, church today. Um, we're going to be starting a brand new series today called Back to the Basics. Um, but before I uh, go into my message, I just want to watch this quick video. For a number of years now, work has been proceeding in order to bring perfection to the crudely conceived idea of a transmission that would not only supply inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal grammeters. Such an instrument is the turbo encabulator. Now, basically, the only new principle involved is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it is produced by the modial interaction of magneto-reluctance and capacitive directants. The original machine had a base plate of prefamulated amulite surmounted by a malleable logarithmic casing in such a way that the two spurving bearings were in a direct line with a panometric fam. The latter consisted simply of six hydrocoptic marzal veins so fitted to the ambifacient lunar wane shaft that side fumbling was effectively prevented. The main winding was of the normal lotus o delta type placed in panendermic semi-boloid slots of the stator every seventh conductor being connected by a non-reversible tremi pipe to the differential girdle spring on the up end of the Grammys. The turbo encabulator has now reached a high level of development and it's being successfully used in the operation of nofertrunions. Moreover, whenever a fluorescent score motion is required, it may also be employed in conjunction with a drawn reciprocation dingle arm to reduce sinusoidal replenition. It's not cheap, but I'm sure the government will buy it. <laughs> I heard someone say, seriously? <laughs> so funny. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that video before, but when I was a kid, this was like super popular, this video. And uh, it makes no sense, obviously, like that's the point. Um, but, you know, as we, as I was thinking about, you know, this series that we're starting back to the basics, this, is the, this video was literally like playing through my mind and I hadn't seen this video and honestly, 10 years. Like, I hadn't seen this video, but as I was just, like, praying and preparing, this video kept coming in my mind of how confusing sometimes things can become when we're just, like, seeing it and we're, like, not even understanding what people are saying. Half those words, I'm not even sure are real words. I'm, I'm not sure. But as I was thinking about, you know, back to the basics, I think sometimes in life, how many times does an idea or a concept or something become so convoluted or so confusing that we actually lose the base value of what it actually means? That it's just become so complicated as we try and explain things, it becomes so complicated. And I think it's time for us to go back to the basics when it comes to the church. Back to the things that the Bible teaches us the church is supposed to be about. The things that, that God you know, placed in, in the church, what the design of the church is supposed to be. I think it's time for us to, to stop be getting, just bring some, some familiarity, some simpleness to what the church is supposed to be. And you know, I don't have kids in school right now. Uh, you know, Jane, our daughter, is getting close. Like she's almost three, so a couple more years before she goes to school. But I'm t I've been talking to some parents, and they're telling me that kids are coming home with, with homework, and there's expectations on how it's supposed to be answered. But parents are looking at the way it's supposed to be answered, and they do not understand how to get the answer that way. I don't know if you've ever had your kid come home and be like, hey, mom, I need to do long division, but it has to be done this certain way. You're like, I can get the answer, but I cannot get it that way, because that way makes no sense to me. It's so confusing. And this is what's happening just around our world is things that used to be in some way so simple. They're tr trying to make it easier, and then what's happening is it's becoming more complicated. And so what we want to do today is, is start this series back to the basics. And basics is defined as the essential facts or principles of a subject or skill. Right, the essential parts of what makes something up. And so that's what we want to go through over the next few weeks. What are the basics 
of the church? What are the things that, that, that the Bible teaches us the church is supposed to do? What does the Bible teach us that, that we're supposed to be doing as believers, as part of a community? And our goal is to bring us back to those essential things that make up who we are as followers of Jesus and align us back to the things that drew us to God in the first place. You know, if we can look back at the time we actually gave our lives to Jesus, can you remember some of the things that you used to do that maybe you're not doing anymore? You know, when you first started following Jesus, how much time maybe you were spending in your Bible or spending in prayer? And, and as things, life has gone on, we've kind of lost our way a little bit. And so really I hope that as we go through this series, it'll help us um, go back to the basics of what it means to be the church. And if we read through the, uh, when the church first kind of started, when, you know, revival was breaking out after Jesus had left and they go into the streets, is Acts chapter two. And this is where we're gonna spend our time over the next few weeks is in Acts chapter two, kind of the beginning of the local kind of modern faith community church. And in my Bible, the NIT, NLT Bible that I'm reading from today, this part of scripture starts with this, the believers form a community. And that's really what um, we wanna kind of start with is that, that church is not just supposed to be a place that we go, it's supposed to be a people that we are. You know, the church is not just supposed to be a location, it's supposed to be a group of people following what God is teaching us and following Jesus wherever he leads us in the world. And so we're gonna be in Acts chapter two um, for, for this series, really just in this portion right here, these, these few verses. And this is what it says in Acts two, verse 42. It says this, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need, and they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. So if we look at the basic part of what the church is supposed to be, this is it. Or this is what we are supposed to be as a church, as believers, as a community. This is what we're supposed to be doing. This is what we're supposed to be seeing. And I think really in North America, I think sometimes we've kind of lost our way when it comes to the point of the church, when, it's, when it comes to the point of why we gather, why we come in community, why we celebrate together. And this is really, if you want to know what the church is supposed to be about, this is it. This is when the church had just kind of started and it says the believers formed this community and this is what they saw happening within their community. And so if you were to kind of create a mission statement of the church as a whole, like local church, it would be this, that the, the local church should be devoted to teaching, devoted to fellowship, and devoted to prayer, right? Because if you go back to that verse in Acts chapter two, verse 42, this is what it says. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer, right? These are the things, if we were to go to the very basic part of what we're supposed to do as believers, this is it. Devoted to teaching, devoted to fellowship, and devoted to prayer. That's what the, the, the mission statement, you might call it, would be for the local church. So I want to go through those three uh, things today um, and just kind of hopefully we can bring some clarity. Hopefully we can just go back to the basis of what we're supposed to be doing as a church. And so number one is devoted to teaching. You know, the best way to receive teaching it says the apostles' teaching is to spend time in the scriptures for what they actually wrote. If you want to devote yourself to the teaching, it's not just, you know, me sharing, you know, what I see. It's also you learning from what the scriptures are teaching us and dedicating yourself and devoting yourself to personal time in scripture as well as corporate time. In scripture. That's the best way to be taught by scripture is to spend time reading what they actually wrote and read the stories and read the miracles and read the insights and read the wisdom. That's the best way for us to grow as, as people, as, as people who are being taught, is actually spend time with the one writing the story, right? You know, the other day, Beth, Jane and I, um, she, it's starting to get warmer, right? So we're trying to teach her how to ride her tricycle for the first time. 
And I, the first time she rode it, I was pretty confident in her abilities to ride the, the, the tricycle. Because, and, like, we live on this kind of, like, slope. Like, kind of, it's not, like, bad, but it's a kind of a slope. And so I was, like, perfect. So I just put her on her tricycle facing down the road. And I was, like, let's see it. And so I'm just kind of walking behind her. I trust her, right? And all of a sudden, she, like, makes this hard turn and goes right into the grass and literally falls and, and slams into the cement off of her tricycle. This is me just, like, literally the first day I'm, I'm like, teaching her to ride back. I'm, like, oh, my gosh. Like, she's, like, crying, and she's, like, crying, and she's crying. And I, was, and I literally said to Beth, I'm, like, I'm done. I'm done teaching her how to ride a bicycle. It's dangerous. Like, this is my, this is my child. And she's falling on the cement. I'm, like, I'm done with this. But Jane, she cries, and she's like, I want to do it again. I'm like, I'm like, no. No, it's too dangerous for you. Maybe we'll go back to in the winter when we were riding your tricycle in the basement, right? And that's safer. But she's like, no, I want to go again. I was like, all right. So then I, 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 uh, I learned that you can actually hold the tricycle. You don't have to just watch. I learned that. If you ever teach a kid how to ride a bike, there's this ability to hold it while they ride it. It's just like this really cool concept I learned. But, um, and so if we started going again. And slowly and slowly and slowly, she started learning, and she's still learning. She's not perfect, but she's learning and learning and learning. And it's because we actually spent the time trying to learn. So if you want to be taught, if you want to learn how to be a better person, if you want to learn how to be a better follower of Jesus, you have to spend some time in the Scriptures day after day after day to grow yourself, to create something new inside of you. That's really what we're supposed to do here as a part of the church. You know, and for me, when I come, you know, on Sunday mornings, I spend a lot of time during my week uh, preparing myself or preparing this, the, the scripture and preparing the message that I'm going to share. And there's a few reasons why I do this. Why I spend a lot of my time preparing for what's happening on Sundays because it's important for me to share the Bible as simply and as relevant as I can so that way we can be changed by scripture. You know, that's part of it. And it's a big task, right? And I remember the first time I, I spoke on a Sunday morning in my old church in Calgary, my brother-in-law came up to me, and this is what he said to me. He said, just remember that uh, you're going to be judged more strictly. And then, I, then, then he left. And you know what that means? It could, James 3.1, this is what it says. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers of the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. That's what he told me. The first time I ever spoke on a Sunday morning. And why they say that is because it's so important. The scripture is so, so, so important. And I have to do my best to try and present it in a simple yet real and truthful way. But the truth is about, about it is that I'm, never, I'm not going to get it right all the time. Like, I'm not going to be able to share this, this Bible. I'm not going to be able to share these verses as well as I wish I could. And there's going to be times where I say the wrong things and I do the wrong things. And, and it's, the reality is, is that every time we receive teaching, we have to go back to the Bible every single time. And make sure that what we're learning is actually based in what the Bible teaches us. We have to learn from, it says, the, devoted to the teaching of the apostles. So that's what we have to do, devote ourselves to the teaching of the apostles. Teaching is important, and what we teach has high, high value. How do we know this? 2 Timothy, 2, 2 Timothy, Timothy 3, <laughs> verse 16 to 17. Timothy, that's hilarious, actually. Maybe that was, no, no, sorry. It says this, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Scripture prepares and equips you to do what you're called to do. That's, that's like, it, 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 it prepares you and equips you to take on the challenges, to take on the battles, to take on the trials that are going to come. One thing I can promise you is there's going to be trials ahead. And what the Bible does is it prepares us and equips us to do every good work in front of us. The Bible teaches us what is true and makes us realize the wrong things in our lives. And it corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what 
is right. Teaching is important. And we can't go away, uh, can't go away with teaching the truth of Scripture. We can't stop teaching what the Bible teaches us about humanity and about the relationship we have with God. But really, if we go down to the core basic thing the Bible teaches us, it's John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his, own, his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. If you want to go back to the basic thing the Bible teaches us, God loves you so much that he sent his son, son so that we could have eternal life. So we don't have to deal with the consequences here. So we can actually spend eternity with the father. That's the core thought of what Bible teaches us. This is the heart of the Father and the heart of our God. And the number two is devoted to fellowship. Connection is key to the church, right? Connection is so key. We are supposed to be in fellowship, not just sit beside each other on a Sunday morning and then go home. We're supposed to be connected as followers of Jesus. Fellowship. This includes having meals together and having communion together. This is exactly what we did. If you were with us this past Good Friday, we had a meal together. We had a brunch and we celebrated communion. Why? Because this is really what we're supposed to be doing, is actually spending time in fellowship, not just in teaching, but actually spending time in connection and vulnerability with one another. This is what we're supposed to be doing, is be connected with each other. Not just come so that way we can, you know, hear a good message and then go home. It's like we're supposed to be connected with one another. And this verse, I, I speak this verse all the time, but it's so important. It's Hebrews 10, 25. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another. Especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We cannot neglect getting together as fellow believers, as a church family. So many people, if we look around the world, have gotten into this habit. It's easier to, to watch a service online than it is to get up and get your family ready and put on the cute clothes and get your coffee ready and get out the door. It's a lot of work when you have a lot of kids sometimes. And I don't do it ever because I'm always here hours before they're even awake. And that's part of why. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's like, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. You know. It's so much easier. It's easy to leave right after the service and then to stick around and have a coffee and talk to somebody. Maybe they're even new to our church. It's easier to just get up and go. But really, the church is not about just getting it off our checklist. It's about growing together in community, growing together as followers of Jesus. It's so important for us to actually have fellowship. You know, it's easier to not serve on a team because that would require me to actually talk to people. You might say, but yeah, I'm not going to invite someone over for dinner. My house is messy. And I'm like... You should see mine. So, like, it's not horrible, okay? We do a great job keeping up with the, with the chores. We do. <laughs> I help, okay? It's for real. But it's like, it's like, I don't want you to actually enter my home. Why? Because then you're going to see the real me. Then you're going to see that my life isn't perfect. That I have Paw Patrol toys literally every corner of my house. And that I haven't got to my dishes in two days. And that the, the ice is starting to melt. And my, my dog's been in the backyard a lot this winter. And it's probably gross. I don't want you to see the real version of me. I want to just show up on Sunday, pretend everything's okay, and go home and be so alone in my brokenness. Fellowship is so important when it comes to the church. We cannot neglect the meeting together. Why? Because strength comes through community. You know, as our world groans for Jesus, as the day of his him coming is drawing near, it's time for us to be together and fight 
for a better future for the next generations. Our power and our courage comes when we come into community. Let us grow in our fellowship, to spend time in each other's lives, on the phone with one another. Do you even know the people sitting beside you? Do you even know what their needs are? Do you know how their kids are doing? Do you know how their parents are doing? Do you know how their work is going? Do you know what's actually going on? And if not, it's probably time for us to start asking each other how we're doing. And not just like, it's so easy, right? How are you? Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made, right? It's am- I'm doing amazing. When on the inside, all you feel is absolute turmoil. But we just are gotten so good at pretending everything's okay when it's not. First John 1, 7 says this. But if we are living in the light... As God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us, all, cleanses us from all sin. The more we bring the darkest parts of our soul into the light, the better our fellowship will be. The, the, the more we share some of the hardest things that we walk through, the stronger we will be. And it's kind of countercultural because a lot of the time we believe that if I share my weakness, what that's going to do is it's going to make you look down on me. But as they've done studies of this, especially in businesses, leaders who are vulnerable with their teams actually have better relationships with one another. Why? Because you start to realize that not that everybody struggles. Everyone has things they go through. Everyone goes through trials and we learn, hey, I'm not alone in this. It's time to maybe bring some of the things into the light. It might be time to have a conversation with your spouse about the things that you're doing in secret. It might be time to talk to your friends about some of your deepest struggles. And, and, and I want to tell you that the deepest and closest fellowship comes through vulnerability and trust. That's how you want to have deep fellowship and deep connection and deep community. It comes to being vulnerable and trusting other people. You know what the church is supposed to be? The church should be a place where you trust enough to be vulnerable and honest. Where you know that the people have your back. Where you know that they're going to be there for you when you need them. That through fellowship we can find freedom. We can find the washing of our sins by Jesus' blood, right? When you bring things into the light, stop hiding them in the darkness. And then the last thing today is prayer. And if we go to the basic prayer, right? We've done a few series over the past few years on prayer. Um, But really the simple thing, the basic thing of prayer is talking to God, right? That's the basic, very foundational thing of what prayer is. It's having a conversation with God. It's sharing your pain. It's sharing your joy. Receiving encouragement. It's listening to his voice. It's asking for help. It's asking for, for provision. Asking for a miracle. Asking for healing. Having a conversation with God. It's praying for someone else. It's sharing your struggles. I think sometimes we complicate it. We complicate prayer by trying to have the right holy words, right? To have the right correct pronunciation have the right theology when it comes to prayer and these are all good like it's not like these are bad but if you want to go to the basics of it all God is asking for you is 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 you to be present with him he's not asking you to say the right words he's not asking you to say tabernacle right like he's like no like to be, be present share your heart with me if you read through The scriptures, you see time after time after time of people sharing their honest opinions about their situation with God, right? Remember Elijah, he's hiding. And God's like, what are you doing here? And Elijah's like, "Um, I just want to die. That's really what he says if you read through it, right? I just want to die. Some of us were like, I can't tell God that. I can't tell God the most broken parts. What if he judges me? It's like he already knows. He already knows how broken and dark things are around you. He already knows. That's why he goes to Elijah and says, why are you here? 
I think God might be asking you the same question. Why are you here? Why aren't you asking me for help? Why aren't you asking me and telling me about what's going on in your life? Prayer is basically going to the basic concept of talking to God. And we have that ability to talk to the creator of the universe. It's not about what you say. It's not about how you say it. It's about approaching him with a humble heart. And this, is what, this is the posture we have to have when it comes to prayer. James 5.16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. You know what the posture we have to have when we go to God in prayer is? Simply humility. You know how humble you have to be to confess your sins to each other? <laughs> to tell your brothers and sisters about your deepest struggles? That takes a lot of humility. Humility is just asking for prayer when you need it. There's nothing weak about needing prayer. Nothing. But some of us were like, I can't let my brother know that I'm struggling with like, and they'll know I'm weak, and I'm not weak, I'm tough. The point of the church, the point of us gathering is to be there for each other. If you think about the, the early church, right, they needed each other. Like, it wasn't like a, this is a fun Sunday event. It's like, they needed one another. Why? Because persecution was really high. There's a lot of financial struggle, similar to today. They needed each other. But we think that if we share our weakness, that makes us weak. But the reality is, if, you, if you're so scared of being honest and vulnerable and transparent, you're fighting a losing battle. It's going to leave you so desperately alone. You know, we all need prayer. We all go through storms. We all go through battles. We have to stop pretending like we don't need each other to keep on fighting. Because we do need each other. And this is exactly, Beth shared a little bit of this last week, you know, is, you know, we've had a lot go on in the past couple of weeks, a lot of sickness. Like we've had our literally three-week-old baby sick three times already. Like literally, weekly. It's like, bah, she's sick again, right? It's been like a challenge. Like it hasn't been like an easy few weeks. But it's also been beautiful. Like I'm not trying to be like, this is horrible. No, like it's been awesome too. We're so grateful and so blessed. But, you know, we needed your support over these past three weeks. And you know what's amazing is we got it. We got it. Like Beth said, we barely cooked any meals. I just opened up the freezer and picked the first thing and throw it in the microwave and hopefully it tastes good. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It does taste good. I'm just kidding. But we've needed you and you've been there for us. And that's, that's the point. Is that, that we've, you know, when you have two kids, like a lot of us, we've done it. Like there's a lot you think about and go through. We need one another. And when we kind of close, when it talks about prayer, is this last verse I want to share is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. It says this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstance. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Some of us were walking around and like, God, what's your will for my life, right? What's your will? He's like, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstance. Yeah, but, but things at work are so tough. Like, like my boss is horrible. He's mean to me. I want to quit. God's like, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstance. But yeah, my kids, they, they don't want to talk to me. They want nothing to do with me. He's like, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstance, circumstances. Rejoice Always. But it's like, but you, you might be like, but I don't know if I can keep going. I'm tired. Rejoice, always. Give thanks in all circumstance. 
This is his will. I want to encourage you as we talk about going back to the basics. Really, this is what the church is supposed to be about. I want to encourage you to be devoted to these three things on a personal level. And as we devote ourselves, which we have been, to this on a personal level, I think what's going to happen is it's going to start to explode corporately as well. Devoted to teaching, learning as much as you can about Jesus and reading through the scriptures for yourself. Again, I'm not going to get everything right all the time. I will say the wrong thing sometimes. You know, there's a pastor uh, in Victory uh, Churches kind of up north. And he got, his, he got his master's in divinity, right? And when he took his final, he got 99.9% or something on it. 99.9%. Incredible. That's like a grade that some of us dream of, right? Like, and then he goes up to his church one day and he's like, guess what? I did this. And he's like, that means that, I think he said, that means that 1% of everything I tell you is wrong. And they're like, oh, right, yeah. I'm not going to say everything right. I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to maybe understand scripture the wrong way. I'm going to. I'm a human being. But it's not my responsibility for you to grow in your understanding of the Bible. I'm going to help. Like that's part of my job. I'll help and I'll, I'll bring as much clarity and simplicity and relevancy to the scripture. But if you're not spending time with Jesus during the week, your growth is going to be so minuscule. Spend time devoted to the apostles' teaching. Read through the scriptures. Devote yourselves to fellowship. You know, don't try and escape church as quickly as you can so you can get to your next thing. Stick around and have a coffee with somebody or invite somebody out for lunch. Connect with your family here. Invite someone over for dinner or invite a family for an activity or do something together. You know, we as a church, we can't always facilitate fellowship. We can't always facilitate it. But fellowship is so, so important. And lastly, let's devote ourselves to prayer. To pray for your family here at our church. To pray for us as your pastors. You know, Pastor Paul Juss, he's our overseer through Victory Churches of Canada for the north. And this is what he says. He says, um, you get the pastor you pray for. That's what he says. So I just want to encourage you, be, please be praying for us because we need as much prayer as you have to give. Be praying for us. Be praying for our family. You know, pray for our church. Pray for your own finances. Pray for, for, for our finances. Pray for our reach. Pray for our mission. Pray for your family. Pray for your spouse. Pray for your children. Pray for miracles. Pray for, for, for provision. Pray for healing. Pray without ceasing. If we want to be the church that God has called us to be, this is how we do it, right? Who is the church? It's all of us. It's not just this building. It's not just me. It's all of us are the church. Not our building. Not just when we arrive here on Sunday, but wherever we go. We are supposed to be the church. And our takeaway today is this. is the basic mission of the local church is to be devoted to teaching, fellowship, and prayer. You might be like, wow, that's not profound at all. <laughs> it's the point. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Devoted to teaching. Devoted to fellowship and devoted to prayer. If you read through Acts 2. Let's not get it complicated. The other things, there's a lot of other things that we're going to go through over the next few weeks that are important. But if we cease to do the very basic things, I believe that we cease to do the full will of God for our city. So I'm going to pray for us today as we go, as we go be the church, wherever we go. And we're looking at, you know, starting a few uh, connect groups, small groups over the next, uh, you know, month or so. So if you're interested in maybe uh, hosting a small group or, you know, leading a group, let me know. We'd love to just promote it and create space for us to connect as, uh, as a family. We are starting our men's, um, our men's, our known men's gathering. It's coming up, I believe it's April 26th. I think we have a slide for it, April 26th or 24th. The Tuesday, 25th, 
sandwich. <laughs> April 25th, I want to encourage you all men. Come on out. It's at 7 p.m. April 25th. It's going to be time where we're going to, you know, have some connection. We're going to have some conversation. We're going to have the coffee bar open. It's time to connect. And then we're hoping to launch some other ones over the next kind of few weeks, over the next month. So if you are interested in hosting or leading a small group, please come chat with me. We'd love to set that up so that way we can continue to connect as a family. But let's pray together. Father, I thank you. First of all, that you love the church. That you designed the church. That it wasn't by accident. And so God, I pray that us here at Known Victory Church, God, I pray that we do exactly what we're supposed to be doing to be the church. That we don't overcomplicate it. We go back to the basics of what we're supposed to do. So God, I thank you that you're leading us. I thank you that you're helping us grow together as a family. And God, I thank you that you are guiding us as we go forward. Help us connect. Help us be encouraged to pray. Help us have wisdom. Help us be there for each other in our hardest moments as well as in our biggest victories. So God, we thank you that you're doing something beautiful in our midst here in Edmonton. And God, I thank you that it's going to be amazing. In Jesus' name, amen.